right. In the last session, we looked at marriage. Marriage, of course, is the foundation for family um, and the work that we do in our home. So we wanted to start with that. And in this session, we're going to look at the purpose uh, that God had in mind for marriage. And he lays this out in Genesis 1.28, which we've looked at many times. Genesis 1.28 says, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth. This same command was repeated to Noah after the flood, and it's actually repeated elsewhere in scriptures as well. So we have a sense that God cares about this. We find more detail on this same command in Malachi 2.15, which says this, Did God not make husband and wife one flesh with a portion of his spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Here it is, godly offspring. So the multiplication of godly offspring is one of marriage's chief purposes. God designed marriage and the distinct role of husband and wife to be the very perfect environment for nurturing, training, and discipling children. Now today we live in the wake of the sexual revolution and we've lost this idea that marriage is oriented towards procreation. With the advent of cheap, readily available birth control, sex and procreation have effectively been severed. Sex today is basically seen as a recreational activity with no relationship or connection to marriage. Indeed, it has no moral component other than the requirement of being consenting adults. A little bit more on this, tragically, pornography has objectified women as sex objects. It's turned sex into essentially a spectator sport. And thanks to the internet, it's become a $12 billion industry. Adultery, fornication, cohabitation, prostitution, sex tourism, sex trafficking, sexually transmitted diseases, rampant abortion, all of this and much more are the bitter fruits that we've reaped. We have to see this for what it is. It's a hideous, massive lie. The sexual revolution promised liberation, but what it left in its wake was basically a wasteland of destroyed and broken lives, marriages, and families. So we have to recover God's view uh, and his purpose for sex. It's urgently needed for the church. Sex was created by God. It's a good and an amazing gift. But he reserves it exclusively for marriage precisely because it leads to procreation. And children deserve a mother and a father. In the Bible, sex is kind of like a river. It's beautiful and it's life-giving if it runs in its God-intended course, which is marriage. But if it jumps outside that course, it's terribly destructive. And that is why the Bible consistently warns us against sexual immorality. For example, Ephesians 5.3, it's typical of a number of passages in the Old Testament and the New when it says, among you, there must not even be the hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity because these are improper for God's holy people. In our, over, our hyper-sexualized culture, where sex and marriage and procreation are severed from one another, it's children that are paying the biggest price. Never in the history of mankind have more babies been aborted, abandoned, abused, violated, exploited, and in some cases even forced into armed combat. Children in the 21st century are not considered a blessing, they're considered a curse, a burden. Increasingly, couples are choosing to delay having children or choosing not to have them at all. And global organizations like the United Nations and even the U.S. government are advocating birth control and sterilization as solutions to the problems of world hunger or birth defects or different kinds of diseases. Rather than obeying God's command to be fruitful and multiply, the birth rate in many nations now has dropped so low that whole cultures are on the verge of literally going extinct. Globally, one-third to one-quarter of all families are headed by single mothers who have precious little time and energy to nurture their children. And even when fathers are present, studies indicate that a typical father will spend less than five minutes a day with his children. That's where we're at, but if we study the scriptures, we see that it's clear from God that he has a radically different view 
of children and of sexuality from today's global culture. Here's the truth. Every child is unique, personally created by God with an immortal spirit, with a mind and a will. Every child has vast potential, incalculable worth. To call children a blessing, as the Bible does consistently, is really an understatement. When Jesus walked the earth, he revealed God's heart for children. And we see this in many places, especially in Luke 18, 15 through 17, which reads, people were bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus said, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. My friend Elizabeth Eumanns, has given her life to educating children all over the world. And she often says this, she says, every child is a promise with a name, with a passion, with a story and a place in his story. Every child is unique. There are no ordinary children. Is this your view? It should be because I believe this is God's view. And we really need to carefully and prayerfully consider this view when thinking about our own families, about how many children we'll have, or what our involvement might be in providing a home for abandoned or neglected children through foster care service or through adoption. And how can we be a model of healthy, biblical, life-giving sexuality to the next generation while we stand against the evils of abortion, of forced sterilization, of child neglect and child abuse.